In the spotlight this morning, Netflix has a show that's got everyone around the office buzzing. This is a robbery is the four-part docu-series. Covers the world's biggest art heist, which happened not too far from here in Boston. I got a chance to sit down with the executive producers of this fascinating limited series. Get ready. This is an interview. It's the number one watch show on Netflix about the biggest art heist in the world. The show is called This is a Robbery, and it lays out the story of the 1990 art robbery at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Joining us now, Colin Barnacle, who directed the docuseries, as well as Nick Barnacle, who is the executive producer. Guys, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Thank you for having us. Hey, and a, and a big congratulations. Look, Netflix is a, is a pretty incredible beast to be working for, and to have the number one uh, show on Netflix is a, uh, is a great thing. It's an incredible platform, incredible people, and we are just blown away by the, by the uh, release of the film and, and the reception it's had. Yeah, so, so what do you think it is about this? For, for anybody who doesn't know, it happened uh, St. Patrick's Day 1990, the biggest art heist in the world. I mean, you guys are, are Boston guys. Is that what kind of drew you to uh, this story? Uh, yeah, uh, we had heard about it for a long time growing up in the metro Boston area. I think a lot of people have. Um, and then when you start to read over the affidavits that are around the crime, possible suspects, the places, the people, you, you know them, you actually know them. Boston's kind of, you know, it's New England. It's a small town. It's everybody somewhere. knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody. So you feel like, you know, you can get closest to the truth, very close to the truth. And, and, you know, I think we did in this case. And I feel like a lot of people feel that way, too. Now, the woman who started this, uh, this museum, actually, it was, her, it was her home, Isabella Stewart Gardner. She was kind of uh, an eccentric woman who just collected expensive pieces of artwork. Yeah, a fascinating individual. Uh, uh, many different walks of life she involved herself in. She was actually a big Boston Red Sox fan way back when. Um, and she, the museum itself is actually the first piece of artwork she kind of created and, and, and designed. It's... It's an Italian palazzo. It's an incredible, onto itself, it's an incredible piece of art. Um, and then she built it with master works, um, 13 of which went missing on March 18th, 1990. Now, if you guys had written this as a movie, you couldn't have had a better cast of, of people involved. Talk about the people who, who you actually were lucky enough to be able to even speak. I can't even believe some of these people even talked to you. <laughs> yeah, some of these people were... Uh... You know, Miles Connor comes to mind. I think most people connect with him as kind of an outsized character, almost like a, a cartoon character going through the light, latter half of the 20th century. He played with Roy Orbison. He robbed museums. He lived with a horse and an alligator. He, <laughs> he's written books. Uh, he is a black belt, and he is a, a, a master of... Uh, Asiatic arts. Um, he, he actually faked being a curator at a museum for a while. Um, yeah, it, it, it runs the gamut from him to, you know, the curator at the Rijksmuseum in, in Amsterdam who knows, you know, everything there is to know about Rembrandt and uh, Vermeer. Now, 13 pieces of art were, st uh, were stolen. Vermeer's uh, The Concert, which was actually, I guess, the most valuable piece of art in the whole collection. And I, and I also was reading, it's the only one that she actually flew to Paris to go to auction to actually see in person. The rest she had, other people, she would buy things sight unseen. Yeah, she, she actually outbid, um, I believe, two museums for that piece. Uh, she outbid... I the Louvre, think, I think. The Louvre, yeah, yeah, which is, you know, think about outbidding the Louvre. <laughs> yeah. uh, but they weren't happy about it either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and she got the piece she wanted. She really wanted that one. Um, Vermeer had just become, uh, it was kind of refound uh, in the later half of the 19th century. It was just in vogue. Um, and there's only 36 in the world. And, and she had had one. Um, now it's, you know, who knows where it is. Welcome back, everybody. Now, earlier in the show, you got to see part one of my chat with the director and the executive producer of the hit Netflix documentary, This is a Robbery. Here's the rest of our talk. Now, I know you guys have been asked about this before, but there were 13 pieces of art that were stolen, but one in particular may have been taken maybe beforehand from the Blue Room. Uh, so I'm going to let Colin get into the details on that, but one of the things about the Blue Room, and which we try to go into depth on, is it's definitely outside of the normal footpath from the other 12. 
um, and it has a unique story unto itself. Uh, the Shape Tortoni has uh, legs within the film, within the series, and we kind of explore where that may have gone. And through that piece of work, you can actually are introduced to multiple characters, some of which people are really responding to. But Colin did a lot of work on, on the footpath and the security that night. It is an anomaly. Yeah. Yeah. Getting into uh, late 80s infrared technology was a very fun bit of the uh, project. <laughs> I, you know, it's one of these, there's the larger mystery of where did all the art go, but there's all these little minor mysteries within that actual night uh, it, itself. In the 81 minutes they're there, which is an enormous amount of time for Deeps to be robbing a place, uh, they're not really showing up for 48 of those minutes. I mean, right. where they are in the museum, nobody knows. And one of the major mysteries is, you know, one of the pieces goes missing from downstairs in the blue room. Um, and the thieves, after they enter the building, the alarms never pick them up in, in that area. Um, so there's always been a mystery of who, who took it. Was it an inside job or, you know, were the alarms, you know, busted? And, and the other thing, too, is when, when you watch the show, they didn't take the frames with the, the artwork. They, they took an, a razor and cut everything out. I would imagine that's the easiest way to get everything out of the museum. Well, that's actually even uh, going a step further. Some of the pieces, when you go to cut them, you'll find out they're, they're, they're almost wood behind there. So there's still marks on a few pieces that they've left. Um, and then there's a few instances where they would take the frame apart where the piece of art was, you know, could fit in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So it was a tremendous, as Colin highlighted, the 81 minutes is something that I think we really explore in, in the project. That's a lot, a lot of time to be in a museum thinking, oh, we don't know who's going to come in the door. Right. Um, and there's, there's something there that gives us space to explore these different characters. And that's a device that Colin uses uh, in the film to kind of explore uh, some of the different crews that are hovering around this museum. Do you guys think in your investigating and actually piecing this together that the two who went in there went in basically with a shopping list? They knew what they wanted and that's the only thing they grabbed because there were other artworks around, but they had a specific thing that they wanted to get out. Yeah, so they have, um, in 1981, there was a, a gang that had attempted to rob the museum prior. They didn't attempt it, they were going to. Um, they had this little blue guidebook, and in the little blue guidebook, there's not pictures of every work of art. It's mostly words. Um, but if you open it up, nearly every work of art that does have a picture in it, they tried to take. Um, and that blue guidebook was in the hands of the criminals in 1981. Um, so it looks like they just pass off the plan to somebody else. And, and that shopping list that they did have, um, for instance, the Shea Tortoni is the only uh, one with a, uh, a picture in the blue room, you know, in the little guidebook. Yeah. Um, it does look like they immediately went for the Rembrandts and that was their target. And then once they either got caught in the museum or realized oh my God, we can't roll these things up and we're driving a hatchback. Uh, you know, we're not, we have a size issue here. Um, it looks like they went around and they're thieves. They're not art connoisseurs. They robbed other stuff that were either to their liking or to their sizing of, you know, can it fit into the back of the, you know, late 80s hatchback. Right. Do you guys think that if the crime happened today with the technology that we have, obviously they weren't doing DNA and a lot of the technology and even the security systems that they would have caught the thieves quicker? I think, that first of all, I don't know that the crime is perpetrated in the first place today. Right. Secondly, we get into some of that. It's very early on in, in uh, crime scene technology and how to secure a crime scene. So there's some very basic policing type things that are not adhered to that today um, would definitely have been in place. And I think you'd have a much better first 48 hours of trying to solve this. Now, I know you've answered this question a million times, and it's the $500 million question. First of all, do you think the art will ever be, will ever be found? Um, do you think it's going to be at somebody's yard sale someplace? Do you think it's under some old lady's bed, and she has no idea what she has? Uh, yeah, I don't think we would have made it if we thought it was all destroyed. You know, I, I do think there are pieces out there that, um, you know, is on grandma's wall. I mean, a Degas sketch could be on somebody's wall. It looks like somebody drew it at Suffolk Downs, you know. Um, the larger works, it's going to be hard for Grandma to, uh, you know, say she had no idea where this <laughs> came from. Ooh, but, uh, surprise! Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I, yeah I, my grandson thinks it. No, it's not going to happen. But I do, 
hope, uh, and I do think that some of the uh, pieces are out there. I'm not sure if all of them are still out there in the world, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain some of them are. Well, Netflix is kind of the biggest, most wanted poster in the world. So hopefully we can track this down. And one more thing, I just wanted to say, I'm sure your father, and I know I, I did see him on TV talking about how proud he is of the two of you and how, uh, how great this documentary went. So I'm sure that's got to make you very happy. Very happy, but he's even more happy the Red Sox are off to a hot start. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for your time today. I really, truly am fascinated with this as everybody else is in the country. And thanks for spending some time. If you want to watch This Is a Robbery, it is streaming now on Netflix.